pressing start. Good morning and welcome back to our second month of finance training for transportation directors. We welcome both transportation directors and finance officers. As a reminder, the purpose of these trainings is to provide information and to help open conversations between transportation directors and finance officers and to help transportation directors better run their departments on the finance side. We do understand that not everyone will, um, not everything will apply to everyone, um, but we hope that each of you learns something and takes a piece of the training with you for future use. So this month we have, we are using the um, Microsoft Teams Live. Um, that means you will not be able to unmute. However, you can um, access the chat feature. So what I'm going to do is show you the chat feature. Okay. And so as Microsoft Teams Live, there you should have in the upper left hand corner a question mark and a comment box. You'll click on that and you'll go down and ask to ask a question. Here, if you signed in anonymously, we do ask that you please change your name to um, so we know who's asking the question. You can go ahead and type in your question and then hit send. OK, um, when KDE sees those questions, we could go ahead and uh, publish it or we may just ask it on the background. You may not see your question and that's OK. Um, we still received it and we can still ask it for you. Uh, little housekeeping reminders, each class we will provide ELA and finance officer hours. You must fill out our surveys to get them. I will post those in the chat box um, sometime this morning. Also, at the end of the series, everyone that attends all of the series will receive a certificate stating that they attended and the number of hours that they completed. Again, we'll be using the chat box to communicate. Um, and this way everyone can attend and participate. Please remember um, that we are starting from the very basics of finance. So some of you have a lot of knowledge and some of you have very little knowledge. We do have um, transportation directors that have as little as three months of um, service in as transportation directors. So we're building on to the previous month. OK, so Last month we talked about account basics, or, um, excuse me, account basic accounting codes. OK, um, this month we'll be hearing from Jason Uren, Uren of uh, Jessamine County on model procurement. And then next month we will be reviewing uh, budgets with Eric Bletzinger um, and uh, we will move forward from there. So thinking back to last month's basic accounting code class, were you able to take back to your district and have a conversation with your counterpart, either in transportation or finance? Please type in the chat box yes or no. We do want to know um, that you got something out of it and that we were able to open up conversations. Also, if you can let us know if you were able to make any small changes or even big changes that will help make things better um, in the future of your transportation department or finance office. Um, type yes or no, and if you were able to make those changes, um, tell us something that you were able to change. I am seeing a lot of yeses and I like to see that and no is OK, um, but that just know that just lets us know that what we're providing you is relevant and that is extremely important to us because we're here to provide you um, with the information so that we can better your transportation and better your um, finance office. For those of you that said yes, 
Um, can you type in something that you were able to apply to your current office? Um, Kristen said that uh, her finance uh, director and she talked about the last presentation and using more specific codes and that's fantastic because what that's going to allow you to do is um, be able to when you when we go to reviewing budgets be able to see where things are and where you're actually spending your money. Okay so this month um, we're going to be talking about model procurement. And I've got Jason here with us. And Jason, are you ready? I am, yes. OK, so we're going to go ahead and bring Jason on. I want to say thank you to everyone that has replied in the Q&A. Um, please do not hesitate to ask questions. We'll work throughout to make sure that we're providing those questions to Jason as he's presenting. Um, and so please don't hesitate. And Jason, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. And I will mute. Say I no longer have the ability to share my screen. All right, then I will share. OK. Hold on, I've got it. Melissa, okay. <laughs> it just showed up. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So um, I just want to say thank you for having the opportunity to talk about this um, topic with you all. Um, this is definitely an area that as finance officers, um, it's very important to focus on, but it's also easily um, easy for us to neglect um, because it, it's definitely got a lot of um, hoops and hurdles you have to jump through and you've got to understand um, what procedures and policies you need to follow. Um, for us in our district, um, we typically um, have vendors that we go through with co-ops. Uh, but anyways, before I jump into this, um, I kind of want to just say that I've been with the district for 11 years. Um, I've been the finance officer for four, um, and so I'll go ahead and jump right in. This is a little weird for me not being able to see anybody at all or see any conversations. So um, I've got a couple stopping points throughout that I'll stop and ask questions. So today we're going to discuss the uh, two different methods of procurements uh, for school districts. Uh, we're going to look into in depth into the general methods of the Kentucky Model Procurement Code, um, specifically looking at each of the five five methods. And then um, throughout the um, presentation, I'm going to talk about um, Jessamine County Schools district perspective on how we handle each of those five methods. And then towards the end, I will touch on um, some transportation uh, bids that we do. Um, I'm hoping that our transportation director Ben Payne can jump on and talk about those because he's got a lot more knowledge than I do um, in that world. And then I'll give you a couple tips and tricks of things that I've kind of learned the last few years that hopefully can help you all. So the two methods for procurement within the state um, are currently is bid law, which is under statute KRS 424, 260, and then the Kentucky Model Procurement Code um, KRS 45A. 345 to 460. Uh, okay. the, yes. Jason, um, it looks like we're having problems with audio. So you're not able me. to hear me. Everybody, I can hear you, but everyone else is saying that they cannot hear this time. Bear with me. Unless they're in the wrong one. I yeah, apologize. At least I was going to say they actually are. They're in the old one, is what it is. That's where Got everyone. It. Yep. OK, We're, I'll get them all working. moved over. All right. all right. Sorry, Jason. I apologize. All right. Oh, you're good. So I can I can continue. You can continue. Perfect. All right. So um, KDE recommends for districts to um, or encourages districts, I should say, to join the model procurement code uh, because it provides more flexibility for districts when you're making purchases. Uh, this next slide I was going to actually ask 
um, if there was anybody on this call that is currently in bid law to kind of get your viewpoint on how it works. But since I'm not able to see comments or talk with you all, I'm just going to skip over that. But this is a great slide to see the difference between bid law and model procurement. Um, if you look at the under $30,000 threshold, this just changed two years ago from $20,000 to $30,000. Uh, when the legislator changed uh, the threshold because of the federal government had updated the guidelines. So if you look at bid law and model procurement for the under 30,000, there's really nothing that's different. You still have to get quotes that are based on your local district school policy based off dollar amounts. Um, same thing when you're looking at the over 30,000 for both bid law and uh, model procurement. You've got to do invitations for bids. Uh, you have to advertise it in your local paper, either on your district website or somewhere on the internet for prospective bidders to find the advertisement. You've got to have detailed specifications for both of them, and then you have to award those bids either based off of lowest price or lowest evaluated bid. So the difference between the two, when you look at the benefits and the pitfalls, is with bid law, there's way less record keeping that's involved, but you have very little flexibility when you're making purchases. With the uh, Kentucky Model Procurement Code, uh, it's a lot more work to document the steps that you've done, uh, but it also provides you a lot more procurement options, so you're not restricted to automatically just going out to bid for every single item that or purchase that's going to be over $30,000. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out on this is in past uh, presentations that I've been in, um, I'd never really knew how many districts were on model procurement and were on bid law. And so I reached out to KSBA and there's currently 26 districts still um, going by bid law and 144 that are on model procurement, which I found that interesting. So what is bid law? So bid law basically is bids for material supplies, equipment or services um, for anything aggregate amount that's over $30,000. Um, there's a couple exceptions that you don't have to go out uh, to bid with bid law, and those are with meat, fish, and vegetables. If you're buying equipment, which that statute's very broad in my opinion, and then uh, if you're doing contract services that are not professional. Um, if, for those of you who are on bid law, I would consult with your board attorney uh, to get more uh, clarity on what you can and can do. So uh, moving on to the Kentucky Model Procurement Code, this is uh, what I'm going to talk about the most. It was um, adopted by the state legislation back in 1978 and became law in 1979 when the American Bar Association um, created it. Uh, the purpose of this was a potentially or was basically for uh, there to be clear guidelines and due to numerous purchasing scandals across the country, they came up with this code to help guide um, government agencies and local public agencies. And Kentucky was the very first one that adopted this procurement code. As of today, there's 18 states that are operating under uh, the model procurement code. And this is basically set out a set of ethical standards that um, we all are supposed to follow. So the KMPC public policy um, was intended to simplify, sim simplify, uh, clarify, and modernize the law governing purchasing in the Commonwealth. Uh, from my perspective, that's a little ironic because for me and then for our district, it was definitely supposed to simplify the purchasing process, but it seems like there's a lot of options which can be overwhelming. So in some situations, it's not necessarily as simple as you, it should have been. Um, it also helps permit us to develop our own purchasing policies and practices. It was to uh, make it consistent across various states when purchasing. Uh, it was supposed to increase public confidence and procedures for public procurement. It was supposed to ensure, or it does ensure, fair and equitable treatment of all persons who deal uh, with procurement. It's also supposed to provide increased economy, and, and it does that by fostering effective competition, which 
is both in the vendor's favor, but also in our favor because it helps uh, keep prices down, but it gives them the advantage to um, cut their costs to, to win our business. And then uh, model procurement also provides safeguards um, for the procurement system to help keep the quality and integrity of purchasing. So who does the KMPC apply to? It applies to uh, Kentucky state government, it applies to local public entities, um, which includes us as school districts um, that, who have adopted the KMPC. And it also applies to um, local public entities who have not adopted the model procurement code, but are still um, utilizing the cooperative purchasing agreements that we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. So within the statute, there's administrative regulations that um, us as school districts must follow. Um, we're allowed to adopt regulations that are uh, more um, stringent than what this baseline um, regulations tell us. Um, but these are the, the minimums that we must adhere to when we adopt model procurement. So the first one being conditions and procedures for purchasing authority. So for Jessamine County within our board policy, it actually um, gives the purchasing authority to me as a finance officer. Uh, it also has, your board policy also has to have um, pre-qualification, suspension, debarment, and reinstatement um, policies. You have to be able, or you have to have in there that you can modify and terminate contracts, um, conditions and procedures for the purchase of perishable and items for resale have to be in there. Um, there needs to be procedures um, on how you go about doing competitive sealed bids. You have to also have in there that you can reject bids, consider alternates, or waive any kind of informalities and in offers that you receive. And then one of the important things is we have to keep the trade secrets and technical data that we receive confidential um, that is submitted by the bidders when we're going out to bid. Uh, the next thing is you have to have a policy that says you can award multiple bids, progressive, partial. Um, it also has to say that you um, are supervising your inventory and monitoring that inventory. Um, there's definitions on classes of what's contractual, contractual services and procedures. And then there's procedures for verifying and auditing of the local public agency. So we have our annual audit every year, and this is something that's part of their scope that they're supposed to be auditing whether or not we're following our own board policy uh, with model procurement. And then our annual reports um, have to be, um, they have to be open to subject, or uh, subject, they have to be open to public records. Um, sorry, I've skipped ahead. Um, with all documents and all email and all communications that we put out there, just keep in mind that it is subject to open record. And that's one of the things within the model procurement is is has to be available uh, to anybody that wants to see it at no additional cost other than just what it costs to reproduce. And then the third administrative regulation within this is local school districts can adopt policies. Again, this is the baseline. We have to adopt model procurement if we decide to go that route and we can be more um, constringent than um, the actual statute. But if we decide to go outside of the specifications, the purchase cannot exceed $2,500. So that was the real exciting stuff um, that I'm sure most of you love to hear. So I'm gonna take a moment to stop now that we've gone through all the exciting statutes and regulations before we move on to the actual five methods and then I give you all the perspective, uh, our district perspective. Are there any questions, Alyssa? I don't see any questions at this time. Is everyone awake? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, we, we have people that were in last month's meeting that are having a hard time um, getting in to this month okay. because they're in the wrong one. So gotcha. All right, well, if there's no questions right now, I'll go ahead and move on. Just feel free to stop me whenever you want. Um, Will do. All right, I appreciate it. All right, so the five general methods of procurement is cooperative purchasing, 
small purchase process, competitive sealed biddings, which include invitations for bids or requests for bids, competitive negotiations, which are requests for proposals, and then non-competitive negotiations, um, which it not practical to bid it's an emergency or it's a sole source so the first method um, there's a lot of different options that we have as school districts to um, search for prices that have already been basically bid out on our behalf um, the first one being is the master agreement through the state price contract um, the states or the finance cabinet has already done the bidding and awarding of a multitude of services and products so it's a great choice to go there as your first option to look to see if, um, if you can just purchase straight through them because then you don't have to do all of the work that's involved uh, with bidding out for the purchase um, and you know that it's already been competitively bid through the cooperative purchasing. There's also the KETS contract that all technology items are purchased through. Um, you've got, I think, three or four vendors that you can go through that have already been competitively bid. And then there's on this slide, which when these go out, um, these are all links to those actual websites. And if you click this all state master um, agreement link, it will take you to um, items that have been out. And I'm gonna go ahead and skip forward one to show you a page that pertains to transportation. So at the very bottom of that link, you'll see all of the bids that the state has already done for the white fleet vehicles. So if you are in need of a vehicle and you don't want to have to go through the process and you don't know exactly what specs you want, you can go right in here, see the price and see what it costs. Um, we're actually currently working on a tire bid in our district. Um, and so we know that this state bid exists out there and it's kind of a baseline for us uh, to look at to know if we don't get a price that's better than this, then we will just fall back on this. But it's good to have this out there in case you need it um, to fall back on because the work's already been done by the department. So within cooperative purchasing, you can also go through the Kentucky Educational Cooperatives. Um, these are organizations like CKEC, which is Central Kentucky Education Cooperative. There's o OVEC, uh, Green River, um, there's a bunch of various ones, KEDC, and many of them have awarded bids uh, for various things. With CKEC, we actually use them for their copier paper bid that they do. Um, so that way we don't have to go out and actually bid out paper. So these are great resources for you all to use to tap into. So you can just purchase straight through them. Uh, there's also the KPC, which is the Kentucky Purchasing Cooperative and they also have a catalog of vendors that they have awarded bids to. Uh, so I would just tap into those resources, resources if you don't have the time to go through a full-fledged bid, um, especially if the price of the item's over 30,000, unless you think um, it'd be to your advantage to go through the bidding process. So if you wanna go outside of the cooperative agreement with the cooperative, um, uh, with the co-op, if the specs of the item or the service or contract is identical and you're wanting to use that as the reasoning why you're making this purchase, the item that you're purchasing cannot exceed the $2,500 threshold. If it does, then you have to go through one of the other methods for making the purchase. So from Jessamine County's cooperative purchasing, this is straight off of our board policy. It's basically what I've already said, but I'm gonna go ahead and, and show that um, we have to, if we're deciding to go through the co-op, but we wanna go outside of the co-op as the reason for making the purchase, that the specification um, has to match or meet the federal government's GSA standards, uh, the State Department's contract, the co-op agency, and if we already have a, a bid that's out there, it's got to meet those specifications first. And then the price has to be at a lower price for the supplies or equipment for number two. And then the purchase can exceed $2,500, like I mentioned. So if all three of those are met, then um, my office, my purchasing manager, or purchasing officer um, verifies that that's been done and we are able to then go through this as our as our option for making the purchase.
So the second method is the small purchase process. Uh, the statute for this is KRS 45A385, which is for um, local agencies. So you're able to go um, through this method as long as the aggregate dollar amount for all items you purchase within a, uh, either a calendar or fiscal year do not exceed 30,000. So if you all are buying, say, I'll say tires, and it's a one-time purchase of $1,000, but you know throughout the year it's gonna exceed 50,000, then you can't just say that you're gonna use a small purchase process. I know, um, I mean, this is a huge hurdle, at least for us. A lot of people just assume that 30,000 is a one-time purchase. And so they'll try to make purchases, um, not knowing that another school or another department may be buying a like item. So if it, it cannot exceed 30,000, you can't artificially split it up like I just mentioned, whether you know or don't. Um, and this may require you to get one or more quotes, but it all depends on what your local school district's policy is governing small purchase purchases within your district. So for us in Jessamine County, our board policy is really straight and simple. It says the same thing that uh, we may be used for any purchase that doesn't exceed 30,000. And so our kind of general understanding that we tell our school bookkeepers and our school departments is anything from zero to that $2,500 threshold. So $2,499 of PO is obviously required. And then we recommend that they get three, at least three verbal quotes. Um, it's definitely better practice to get three written quotes, but if they exceed that $2,500 threshold up to 30,000, um, they must have uh, three quotes that accompany the purchase order. And then if it's over $30,000, it requires us to go on to the next method uh, to formally bid out the items or services. So for competitive sealed bidding, uh, this statute is 45A365, and this is generally called invitation for, for bids. Uh, we do request for bids. It's kind of the same thing. Um, the specifications for whatever you're wanting to buy are easily determined up front and very concise. You know what you want, and you just need someone to respond to it. So when you go out to bid, you're supposed to give seven days notice before the bid opening. You advertise it either in your local newspaper or um, online. And the bids are open at a set time and place and they're open publicly. So the potential bidders can come and hear what the other um, prices are that people have submitted. The evaluation on the bids are done based off of the type specifications and criteria that was put into the bid that was sent out. And the contract is supposed to be awarded um, within a reasonable time in written notice given to the, the bidder that won based off of either the lowest bid price or the lowest evaluated price. So for Jessamine County, when we do competitive sealed biddings, we um, actually try to do our due diligence to find out all the potential bidders that are either in the state or that are local. So I'll give you an example. When we go out to um, bid for our auditors, typically that's an RFP, but it's the same kind of process. We will try to find through the state website all of the potential auditors in the state and we will um, either mail or email them um, the invitation for bid whenever we're, we're doing that to go out. And the reason we do that is um, we want to have competition. So the more people that know, the better, because uh, we can potentially get a better price. And um, it saves from us knowing that we missed somebody. We don't try to just pick the auditor that we had the last time and send it to them. We try to, to be fair and send it to everyone that we know that's done a school audit because we know that they have the experience. And when we send those out, we allow 14 days. So two full weeks from when we actually advertise it. And we do that to give the bidders plenty of time to put something together that's thought out and that's not rushed. Um, and then we award those contracts after our board meets and our board meets every month. So sometimes there with timing, it could potentially be up to 30 days or over 30 days. And we approve those based off of the lowest price um, or the best evaluated bid. And it, again, it depends on what we're doing. If price is our main 
um, purpose or our main uh, desire, then we'll do that. But a lot of times with auditors, we've got a weighted scale that we are weighted factors that we take into consideration um, to determine who would be the best fit for us. Uh, a couple best practices with this is I would always reserve the right to reject any and all bids when you're sending them out. We actually had an experience uh, where when we did this, we thought it was clear cut, but we had two different responses and we had to reject both of the bids and start the process all over. So it was clear for everyone bidding. It's also if price is not a factor, I know I've already said this, but you can include uh, weight factors as long as they're measurable. That way it can help you with the decision. If price isn't the main driving force and you want um, their experience or qualifications or anything else to be part of the decision, yeah, you can also do that. And then also speaking from experience, I would include an opt out clause in case um, the vendor says that they can provide a service or a product um, and they end up not being able to provide it or not in the amount of time that they said they could. Um, you need to have that flexibility or ability to opt out of that contract if needed um, so you can switch to somebody else that, that can actually meet it. Is there any other questions before I go into the next slide? Alyssa? I don't see anything at this time. Don't forget you can ask questions at any time and we will let Jason know. All right, so the next method is the competitive negotiations, which is similar to the competitive seal bidding. Um, with this method, your proposals will be called proposals, requests for proposals. Um, it's a lot lengthier time process than doing the competitive seal bid because you may know what you want, but you still want to have the option for the vendors to come up with um, solutions that might meet the need of the district. And a perfect example I can think of for this is when we send out a RFP for our bank bid, we know that we want the highest rate interest rate as possible, but we also want to know if there's anything that the bank's willing to throw in that could potentially put them at an advantage over uh, other banks. So one of them that's in there is we ask them if they want to um, waive all fees or if they want to provide check stock or even deposit slips for free that that will be taken into consideration. So that's why we do an RFP for our bank bid. Um, and these are not supposed to be open in the public. So I can go ahead and say that that's one of the things when I went through this that I, I kind of had an aha moment that we needed to stop making those open to the public because that does cause problems. Um, so that's something that we definitely need to work on. So it was good that um, I, I unveiled that because we did run into a situation where we opened them publicly and everyone knew what everyone's cards were and we didn't have the ability to go back and uh, negotiate. The evaluation uh, should be completed by a committee or a team. I wouldn't just do it by yourself as the finance officer. I would try to pull in if it's something related to transportation. I would try to pull in the transportation director or someone else within your office just so there's a committee and more than one eyes looking at it to see if it meets the specs and criteria that you put in the bid or in the proposal. And then um, this may include discussions back and forth with the bidders to make sure you understand what they're offering um, just so there's full clarity and you know what it is you're approving or not approving. So in Jessamine County, our process is pretty much identical to the invitation for, for bids. Um, I put on here that we don't make it public. Um, that's as of today. Um, and we do go through the same process. So when we send out those RFPs, we try to find everyone that we know that could be, be a potential bidder. Um, and we also advertise it in our local paper. We give them 14 days and then sometimes, depending on what it is, we may give them more time, but usually two weeks is our is our window. Um, and then our contracts are, again, are awarded by the board. Um, even though we recommend one, the board always has the opportunity to pick another one. Uh, same thing with the best practices, always uh, reserve the right for anyone to, re or to reject any and all bids. And then um, a lot of times with this, you wanna do a weight factor and not pricing. And then the last method is the non-competitive negotiation. So this method gives 
the school districts the ability to determine that competition is not feasible and you have to basically put it in writing why you're not going through one of the first four options and it also lists out the the various options that you have so if, obviously if there's an emergency that exists you can go ahead and pick a vendor and buy whatever you need and just say we needed this immediately um, a lot of districts and i know even us will probably just say oh it's a single source uh, we can't find this apple computer anywhere else because it's apple well there are other computer companies so um, this is one that's not really looked on favorably as as an option um, you also don't have to justify if you're going to go with a licensed professional um, this is one of them when i get to the next slide that I'm always quick to remind our board attorney every year that if we wanted to, we could bid out his services, but he points out this method uh, every single time I bring that up. Uh, also don't have to justify for perishable items, uh, replacement parts for transportation. So if it's something that you need immediately, uh, if an emergency doesn't exist, but it's to replace a, a bus part, you can use this method. If it's items for resale for student groups, if it's for travel, if it's for insurance, and then if there's a sale at a reduced price. So this should be definitely your last resort. You should already try to look through one through four to make sure you can justify going through the non-competitive negotiation option. And you really should try to keep the contract period as short as possible. So you can go back to look to see if there's the ability to either bid it out or go through one of the options. And um, you should attempt, like I said, to go through uh, any other one through four. So for us in Jessamine County, this is our board policy. Um, it basically says the exact same thing. It goes through the uh, various exceptions that you can use to justify going through non-competitive negotiation. The one thing that we have in our policy is if it's over a thousand dollars, we've got to at least provide three quotes if this is what we're deciding. And I know that um, differs from our small purchase policy, but this is basically for us to show that we at least, we know this isn't the best option to, to say it's non-competitive negotiation, but we're at least doing our due diligence to show that we try to get the best price and didn't just pick um, a vendor that we have a relationship with. We're, we're trying to show that there is some transparency that we're not just automatically going to Walmart or to Amazon because it's convenient. So when I was putting this together, the, the two that I know that we do on a consistent basis, like I said, our board attorney, um, I joke with him that we could bid it out, but he points this out. And then with our district insurance policies, um, we didn't actually go through any kind of um, process, but we did do about three years ago, we went through an RFQ process, which is a request for qualifications. And we did this because we didn't really, uh, I mean, I don't really have the expertise like agents do to know exactly what um, insurance policies we would need to protect us. And so we rely on them for that expertise. And so we went through this process with our superintendent, deputy superintendent and myself and our purchasing supervisor. Uh, and basically what it was was just an interview process with the various agents uh, to see what their experience was and to kind of find which one was the best fit for us. So even if you do go through a non-competitive negotiation, you can always go through that RFQ process um, to see if um, the vendor is right for you. All right, so this illustration, um, I find this the most, most helpful um, when trying to determine which method we're going to go through when we're trying to make a purchase. I actually borrowed this from David Morris with Boyle County. Um, this is in his financial management manual. And basically this walks you through one through five. So if you ask yourself, is the item available through an existing bid? If the answer is yes, then if it's a, through a co-op or a district bid, the answer is yes, then you have to ask yourself, does it meet one of the exceptions within a non-competitive negotiation. If it doesn't meet one of those exceptions, then you have to purchase from the co-op or from the existing district bid. If it does meet one of those exceptions, uh, then you can go ahead and purchase it under the exceptions. If you're back at the starting point and it doesn't meet um, 
or it isn't available through one of the existing bids, then you have to ask again, does it meet one of the exceptions in the non-competitive negotiation? And if the answer is yes, then you can go ahead and per make the purchase, but you need to document um, why it is that you did. If it doesn't meet an exception, then you have to decide, is this item a one-time purchase that no one else in the district is buying that won't ever exceed the 30,000 in aggregate? Or is it going to be below that? If it's below that, then you just refer to your small district policy within your district, uh, which tells you what you need to do to make that purchase. But if it does, then you need to do a competitive sealed bid or you need to go through the competitive negotiation process. So if you don't like reading through all the rules, this is definitely something that um, is very quick and easy to kind of figure out. Um, so I find this to be probably the most beneficial slide when making a purchase and deciding what to do. All right, so with our transportation department, I was hoping uh, Ben Payne could be on the call. Is he on the call, Lisa? Yes, Ben, you can go ahead and unmute. Or not. Well, I was hoping he could speak to this for a second, but if he can't, um, I can go ahead and touch on it. He may not be on the call. Well, are there any questions off the on the five methods of procurement before I go into um, just a couple more slides? Let's see here. I don't see any questions at this time, and I have okay. asked them to also put in their questions for the Q&A um, after the fact. Uh, ben, if you just came in, you can unmute um, regarding diesel fuel and tires. Can you? I'm not sure if you can hear me now. We can hear yes. you. All right, sorry about that. It took just a second to catch up. Uh, good morning, all, and, and kind of... Ben? Can you hear me now? Yes. I can, yes. Right. Hang on just a second. I'm getting feedback. Elisa, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, he's gone. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and talk this and if he can jump back on um, that, I think it'd be helpful for other transportation directors to kind of hear what um, he's doing. So uh, in our district, we do an annual diesel fuel bid, and this is a link. So when you get this, you'll be able to look at what our bid uh, looks like in case you want to use it for your own district. But we do this to basically ask our diesel vendors if they can provide us a plus minus off of the rack price so that way we've got uh, a built-in price for the year and so when prices fluctuate we know we're going to either be above or below that rack price uh, the reason i put this on here is because we ran into a situation a while back that we weren't actively monitoring the vendor who was sending us fuel and i just want to basically point out that as a transportation director, if you can check those monthly, if you have an actual contract, check them to make sure you're getting the price that you were promised to get. Because once time moves on, it's really hard to go back and ask the vendor um, to refund because they didn't charge you the correct price. Um, it, it's good to do that monthly if you get fuel monthly. Um, it's something that in the finance office, uh, we try to check it when it's fresh in our mind when we first get that contract and we see the invoice but after time's gone on um, we just expect if uh, you're making the purchase to at least verify before it comes into our office and then a new one to us is um, doing new and retread tire bids that's why i was hoping ben could get on and talk about it um, this is new to us we've actually always just gone through a local vendor um, and we've never actually really bid it out. We've, um, I think, went through the state bid price. 
and um, we're trying to bring all of this in house, try to get some competition. And so we're using that state contract as a baseline. We know what we want, but we're hoping that we can get a better price. Um, and this is something that he was familiar with in his previous district before he came to Jessamine County. And then the third thing I was going to put on here is vehicle purchases with your white fleet. Okay, hey, ben. ben. I think I'm back in now. <laughs> yes. All right, no feedback. <laughs> All right, guys, sorry about that. Uh, Technology is great until it doesn't work. Um, so I'm not sure kind of where we left on it, uh, where we left off at or what you heard or what you didn't hear, but uh, as far as like the vehicles or the, the diesel fuel bid, um, to the new directors and new finance directors that were that are on this call, kind of where we start is, is is we determine kind of, you know, what's the need, what does the district need? You know, what are the needs for the vehicle or the tires or the whatever we're bidding at the time? Um, we get together with Jason and I and uh, we get together and determine if it's a vehicle. Okay, what do we need this vehicle to do? What's its job? What does it need to do? And determine the specs. You know, new transportation directors, you don't, this is an important part of it because you don't want to get a half ton truck that you're, you bid out a half ton truck that you're asking it to pull bulldozers and bobcats overweighted and all that stuff. So we determine the need of the vehicle and make sure that the specs of the vehicle that we are bidding match the needs uh, of the D, uh, the DOT regulations and, and everything that we're going to need to do. Um, and then the next, once we determine all that, the next steps that I do is I go straight to the master bid list. Uh, that's what it's already been bid out for us. I kind of pull the specs off of what we want uh, to match those needs uh, from the specs, including all the vendors, Chevrolet, Dodge, all the different types of the vendors, get the specs of those, um, and then I send it out to all of the other vendors. Uh, and then also there's a third option of a leasing agreement that you can do if you use like an enterprise or, or some type of thing that I'll go into here in just a minute uh, with the leasing company. But once we determine our needs, we determine our specs, then we build a bid packet. Put together, start putting a bid packet with the terms, the conditions, uh, and the due dates of what we're asking for. Um, and then once we get that put together, we, we now we send it out for what Jason was talking about earlier. We do the 14 day advertising, um, the newspaper, social media, um, our our personal web page um, that takes care of the advertising part of it. We send out emails to all the local vendors and vendors around us that we want to put in a bid. Uh, and once we get all that stuff together, once we get all the emails, once we get all that stuff, we um, sorry about that. Once we get all the information back, the end date of, a, of accepting the bids, we get together, we open the bids, and we use, like Jason was talking about earlier, we use a weighted scale. Mm -hmm. Whether we're looking for price being the main driving point or we're looking for whatever matrix that we set up, like uh, one of our bids, we set up a matrix of five different things. One of them's quality, quality of vehicle, service you know what kind of service have we been getting as far as warranty work uh parts and labor and things of that nature um availability uh the cost is obviously one of the matrix on there and then capability of uh the meeting the needs that for the district that we've got and that's usually a point system of you know you can use one to ten one to five whatever your district decides to use and then that gives you your weighted average for all of each individual bidders that has bid on it to help make your decision a lot better. Um, and one other point on the bid with the emails is if if one of the vendors sends you an email with a question asking a question about what you're bidding in particular, make sure that you hit reply all. That way that 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 everybody has an equal playing field and everybody knows all the questions that are being asked. There's nothing, you know, everything's out in front. Um, 
Yeah, that I would say this. Go ahead. Sorry, I was so sorry to interrupt you, Ben. I would say the same thing too. If you get a phone call or in-person meeting with a vendor, um, you want to make sure that um, you're trying to give everyone the same information across the board. So if they do call you with a surprise question, uh, make sure you follow it up with an email to everyone just so everyone's in the loop on what information was given out so sure. someone doesn't have an advantage. Sure, that's, I mean, that's a, a yeah. just, that's an excellent point, Jason, and, and just keep everything as equal level playing field as you can. Um, once we determine, okay, this is what we're going to go with, like Jason said, you know, we turn in our recommendations to the board. They take, you know, they either accept it or they give recommendations on what they want done. And then after the board meeting, we can abort, award the bids. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate it, Ben, with you chiming in. Um, I, I was going to touch on this vehicle piece, too. So uh, with you all managing white fleets, we started two years ago with Enterprise uh, before Ben joined us. Um, we ended up having to join a third party co-op called Sourcewell in order for us to do business with Enterprise so we could justify that we were um, following our own policies. But basically what they do for us is it's definitely a little bit of a premium um, and Ben can attest to that, but they take over our white fleet managing from service to purchasing and we haven't made it this far yet but from also selling the vehicle on our behalf so we don't have to manage any of that i don't know if that's an advantage in your district or not um, that's something that um, seemed to be easily neglected for us and our fleet was aging significantly so this is a way for us to update our fleet and have someone else manage it I know um, since Ben's got way more experience in this area, he still seems to think that we can bid it out and take back on um, that additional work and save money. So I'm hopeful that we can do that in the future. But if neither one of those options work for me, for you or for your district, you can always just still fall back on the state contract on that master agreement and purchase your white fleet through through there. Anything else from you, Ben, that you can think of? Well, I just wanted to know if there was any questions that, that, that people had that they would like to go further in depth on as far as that, you know. Yeah. So it's been really quiet today. We have no questions at this time. Alisa, we're teaching really well or we put everyone to sleep. Everyone's yes. asleep. <laughs> well, that's why I tried to, as much as possible, put in our district perspective because I know some of this can be very dry and very dull. Um, and so sitting in these kind of trainings in person, it's it's better, definitely better in person so you can um, get some feedback and get some interaction, but especially when you're dealing with modern procurement. Um, I'll go ahead and move on to some of our tips and tricks um, that I've learned that um, would be great opportunities for your district if you don't already have them. Uh, the first one being um, signing up for a district credit card or going through um, a virtual type credit card. For us, it's called electronic accounts payable options. I know other districts use a different vendor and it's called ACI. Uh, we started this, I think, three years ago and we now earn uh, anywhere from one and a half to 1.75% back in cash rewards um, just for our purchases. Um, we pay them either through a plastic credit card or through a virtual credit card to um, the vendor's accounts receivable department, and then they pay it as if it's a credit card. Um, I wanted to make this a point for all finance officers and transportation directors, since you guys do spend a lot of money, that if any of your vendors are willing to accept credit cards, this is a great option for you. Um, to generate some money back based off of just your spend. Um, I know vendors are getting more um, cued in on what we're doing, and we have noticed here recently that some of our larger vendors have started charging us a uh, 2 to 3% fee. So if they start doing that, then obviously it's to your advantage to go back to checks. Um, but I mean, any purchase you can have, it doesn't hurt to ask, um, especially when you get new vendors, ask them if they would rather get their money quicker 
um, through a credit card. The second thing I wanted to put on here um, is when you're going through a state contract, um, I had an experience with one of them and um, I did a quick Google search and it was a lot cheaper online. So I just asked them if they could do a better price than what was showing on the state contract and and they were willing and able to make that work um, for us to not have to go through another um, alternative. I would also shop around um, if it's a hundred dollar purchase. I know a lot of our schools and departments just tend to fall back on um, what's normal uh, running to Walmart or purchasing on Amazon, um, but at least shop it out. I mean, every little bit helps and it adds up. And since we don't have a lot of opportunities to generate or additional revenue except through taxes, this is a way to cut expenses um, for your district to save some money. So everything that I've touched on and all the documents and links I've put on this page um, in case the one thing you take away from is how can I get everything you just talked about? This will take you to every single link um, and it'll give you all of our board policies here. Um, it's at, I've actually got our tire bid and fuel bid on there that are works in progress, but it's at least a starting point for you um, if you want to use it. So with that being said, I know I've asked for questions a lot because I was hoping there would be some, um, but if there's any questions or if you've got anything for me, Alyssa, or if there's anything you want to say, Ben, uh, let me know. I appreciate it though. Well, Eric um, of Russell County said the instruction is so good, questions are not needed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just so you know, they are listening. Um, but if there are any questions or maybe any topics that weren't covered, please, um, you know, type them in. Um, I know we talked about fuel and we talked about tires. Um, I have heard from some districts previously um, that they bid their fuel quarterly, you know, to make sure that they're getting a decent price. Um, um, you know, so Jessamine County, I think you said you do it annually. Is that correct? Yeah, we've always done it annually, but I think um, I think Ben is wanting to do it annually with the option to renew every year if, if we think the rack price uh, plus or minus is good enough. Is that correct, Ben? That's absolutely correct. I use I, I like the one plus two bid options. Um, and, and one other point, Jason, that, that I would like to tell the other, the directors is is Whenever you get your bill of lading sheet from your fuel delivery people, make sure that you compare it. You know, every, I compare every one of them to the bid sheet that I've got. Sometimes, you know, depending on how you bid your fuel, uh, you could get into what they call the the um, where uh, a fuel broker. You 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 purchase your fuel through a fuel broker where they're going to send it out. There's no telling where you could receive your fuel from. You could be getting from Nashville or Cincinnati or, you know, one of the, the larger depots. Once you bid your fuel out, make sure every 14 days or, or however much fuel that you receive that you're comparing the bill of lading, lading receipts, invoices with your bid that you've currently done. Uh, that's I can't stress that enough. That's an important piece of it, but I like to bid it out with the one plus two because I want to hold that. You know, you could get algae or water or you know try and keep it as as the, the the same as much as I can, as much as I possibly can, because that that way I can go back to a specific person and say, okay, Jason, you know, you brought me some fuel. Now I'm getting water in my tanks. Um, mm -hmm what can we do about this and how can we fix this going forward it, it it lets you be hold your fuel people a lot more accountable than just random people bringing you the fuel going through the uh fuel brokers yeah and we had said that um if price isn't always the the main driving force if the relationship and the service is also important um you also want to keep in mind who your vendors are. If they're local, I know we want to save public tax dollars, but you also don't want to nickel and dime them every single year to drive that price down because it is a lot of work for you. It's a lot of work for them. So I think doing the 
one to three year bid definitely gives you some flexibility to build that relationship with your vendors too. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. In Henderson, in Henderson years ago, we uh, bid through local, a uh, local dealer there, and and I'm sure a lot of the older directors can remember when biodiesel was a thing. Uh, we actually had a an issue where we had algae in our fuel tanks, and man, we were stopping up hundred dollar filters every other day. You fuel Jeez. filters. Mm -hmm. So us being us having a, a single provider, we were able to go back to that provider and they were able to pump out our tanks, um, you know, clean the algae out of our tanks, help us out with the fuel filters that we were spending on, and they completely were held accountable and, and fixed the issue without us having to do a lot more paperwork. That's one pro to the situation, and, and I really enjoy it and suggest it. Okay, thank you. Um, let me see here if we have any questions. Uh, if a district is getting, whoops, it just went away. So let me go over here. <laughs> if a district is getting rid of old buses that are less than a thousand dollars in value, do those have to be bid out? Um, well, that you'll have to chime in to my May presentation for inventory for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent retort. <laughs> um, honestly, it depends on what your board policy is. Um, just speaking from experience for us, we've always gone th for the the buses. We've always gone through the Kista sale. And then this last year, we actually uh, sold a few of them through the paper. We did uh, basically an invitation for proposals or bids from individuals or companies, and they sent them in. Um, we did that to see if we could get a better price than Kista, but I would check your board policy to, to see what it says, because um, you'll definitely have to get it retired so it, it gets off your finances and then um, go through however you can get rid of your fixed assets. Hey, Elisa? Yes. They also, like Jason said, let me echo what he said with your district policies. You know, you want to get it off your assets, you want to get it off your, your KDE school bus inventory list. Mm -hmm. um, and also for the new directors, you know, I kind of compare it to uh, you look at Kista, you look at sending it out into the newspapers for bids, uh, and then I also look at scrap prices. You know, as far as I'm not going to give them, give it to them. You know, if if scraps up and I know I can get this much out of the bus just in scrap, then I don't let them underbid me on that price as well. You know what I'm saying? I'll, you can keep them to next year or you can take them off your inventory and you can scrap the buses out okay. if it's under a thousand dollars okay um there has been comments that they'd like to share the presentation um with their purchasing specialists as well so um we will make sure that we share that with everyone um it was a very good presentation thank you jason um okay. And someone also said that it helps keep them fresh on what her, their involvement is and things that they need to be involved in more often. So, which is part of why we're doing this is we want you to all be aware of, um, you know, what what your responsibilities are as transportation directors, as well as, you know, how to work with your finance officers. So we are at 1134. Um, do we have any other questions or any other comments? Um, I don't have anything else other than if anyone wants to email me, call me, please feel free to. Um, if you have any questions or if you want me to, to answer anything, I'm happy to help. Um, I do want to reiterate that this is one of those areas where you can save a lot of money, but it's also one of those areas that we tend to neglect because um, it's got a lot of it's got a lot of hoops and hurdles that you have to go through, but it also um, can help your district. Thank Other you. than that, I appreciate you all letting me um, have this time and I'm doing this presentation again um, at CASBO if anyone is interested in hearing it a second time from um, <laughs> not just transportation, but I also do a lot more district bids that we've we've touched on. Okay. Well, 
Thank you so much. Um, in the uh, chat box, um, I have put the link for the Survey Monkey um, so that I can get your information. I want to apologize to all of those who um, were having trouble getting in. Um, it is my understanding that once you hit, um, once you had accepted the invitations, uh, somewhere, the link went somewhere. <laughs> um, they should be in your um, calendar. OK, and um, there should be a join link or you should be able to go down to the bottom and uh, join on the link. But if that was not the case, please let me know um, and I will figure out how to make this better and easier for the next presentation. Um, <clears throat> again, I want to say thank you to everyone. Um, the uh, information was phenomenal and um, I, I think that everyone was able to take away a little bit of something. So um, we don't have anything else and since we had a quiet crowd this week, we don't have a lot of questions. So I, we're going to let you go early um, and uh, if there's anything that you can think of after the fact, please share those questions. I will be happy to share with everyone else um, or like Jason said, reach out to Jason. So thank you so much everyone and you have a wonderful afternoon. Stay safe and stay dry.